Hello, all you big, beautiful brains out there. Today, we're going to talk about the cognitive theory of development. Before we get started, take a minute to subscribe to Psy vs. Psy. Help out your friendly neighborhood psychologist while I tell you all about cognitive theory. So, there are two big developmental theories that have made a huge impact on psychology. One of them is the psychosocial theory, and we've already got a channel video on that one. Today, I'm going to explain the other big theory, cognitive theory. Cognitive theory was first developed by a Swiss psychologist named Jean Piaget. And Piaget was quite the character. He was publishing papers in zoology by the time he was a teenager. He even went through what turned out to be a fake kidnapping. Really, his personal life could be a whole video just by itself. But our story starts when he was working for a guy named Alfred Binet. If that name sounds familiar to you, it's because Binet was one of the developers of an early intelligence test that we now call the Stanford Binet. Piaget actually started off his career administering IQ tests, but noticed that when younger children were getting answers wrong, they were doing it in similar ways. Piaget surmised that child's brains must think and process differently than adult brains. He built his cognitive theory off that basic idea. He thought that thinking or our cognitive skills were central to how we developed. In other words, our cognitive abilities develop through stages and we shift how we think as we age. Let's take a look at Piaget's stages so you can get a better idea of what I mean. The first stage is called sensory motor and it takes place from when we're born until we're around two. In this stage, how we think is greatly influenced by the world around us, specifically the information we're trying to figure out from our senses. We're learning how to look, how to listen, and how to separate what is us from what is the world around us. We're trying to do things like figure out object permanence, where just because you can't see something doesn't mean it's not there. Babies usually develop object permanence around five to eight months old. Trust me, once a baby develops object permanence, peekaboo just doesn't have the same magic. <laughs> the second stage is the pre-operational stage, and it's from when you're two until about age seven. This stage is focused on symbols and pretend play. At the beginning of this stage, kids start to use objects symbolically, especially when they're playing. Kids in this stage also really struggle with the concept of egocentrism. That's the idea that they are the center of everything. They have a really hard time understanding anyone else's point of view. From age seven until about 11, kids are in the concrete operational stage. This one's easier to remember because the name is really everything that they're about at that age, concrete reality. They're separating fact from fantasy. At this age, kids start to be able to think really logically and even start to use mental tools like inductive reasoning, where they can look at information and figure out principles that govern that information. The last stage Piaget identified was formal operational. And this stage starts at about age 12. It's all about using abstract reasoning. We start to be able to think hypothetically so we can use our brains to test out alternatives to situations. But, this just wouldn't be Psy versus Psy if we didn't point out that there are some major criticisms of Piaget's ideas. For starters, there might be a much wider age swing on achieving some of these mile swings than Piaget identified in his stages. Like there are some three-year-olds who are at the very beginning of their pre-operational stage who aren't egocentric and can very easily understand that others might have other literal and figurative points of view. That's the stage that's supposed to be characterized by being egocentric. Individual differences like this can mean that kids who are about the same age might be two completely different stages. Another big problem is that the research that Piaget himself completed. 
a lot of his work was done in smaller research populations where the children were from really highly educated, rich families. So it's very difficult to generalize the work that Piaget himself did to an entire population of people. So then why do we still study Piaget? If he didn't create any long-lasting experiments, or if his stages probably aren't really on target, why study him? Piaget is mostly still studied today because he was the first major scientist to really identify that our brains during childhood were different. We think differently as children. We behave differently than when we're adults. For us today, that seems to be rather intuitive. Of course kids are different, they're kids, right? But predominant thought up until that point in time was that children's brains were just tinier versions of adult brains. Piaget's work helped change scientific thought because even though kid brains aren't just like adult brains, that doesn't make them bad, just different and worthy of being studied for exactly what they are, unique and wonderfully children. If you want to find out more about your unique and wonderful brain, make sure you subscribe to Psy vs. Psy so you can get all of our other videos and you can learn all about the science of psychology. Until next time, keep thinking, and I'll see y'all later. Bye! Ready? Okay, other things besides Jean Piaget that are Swiss. Go. Swiss cheese. Swiss miss. Swiss rolls. Swiss uh, the Swiss meringue. Eh? Eh? <laughs> Swiss watches. Uh, uh, Swiss chard. Okay, that's the first vegetable. It's getting kind of late in the list. I don't know.